Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to present my thoughts on your very important task. My comments will focus on gaps in our knowledge base. While I recognize that your charge extends to all tick-borne diseases, due to time constraints, I'll primarily address Lyme disease. Prevention involves limiting exposure, using protective measures, and managing known bites. Is it possible and feasible to produce a sustained reduction in tick populations and or halt range expansion? What are the motivators and barriers to practicing prevention? What's known about the relative effectiveness of various personal prevention strategies? If we can't get people to take all steps, which ones do we prioritize? We need a highly effective strategy for managing high-risk bites and neither single dose doxycycline nor topical azithromycin are it. Although earlier studies of multi-day regimens failed to demonstrate efficacy, Zeidner's findings suggest that this strategy deserves further study. Might herbal preparations work, thereby avoiding antibiotics altogether? The pathogenesis of Lyme disease requires additional study. It would be useful to know how species and strain variations in these areas play out in infected individuals. Clinicians might be better able to tailor antibiotic regimens based on the identified strain's pathogenicity and antibiotic susceptibility. With regard to host pathogen interactions, is there something to be learned by studying healthy seropositive individuals? What explains variations in clinical presentations? Is it due to differences between B. burgdorferi strains, differences between hosts, or a combination of these elements. Consider the EM rash. If it represents an immune response to the bacteria as they migrate through the skin, what does its absence imply? Does it reflect an impaired immune response or simply infection with a strain that doesn't elicit that specific response? Disease latency is known to occur, but how and why this happens is unknown. Similarly, triggers for B. burgdorferi reactivation have yet to be identified. The clinical relevance of morphologic variants and persister cell populations needs to be formally investigated. In vitro studies demonstrated that morphologic variants and persisters do not respond to commonly prescribed single agent regimens. Clinicians who treat long-standing cases of Lyme disease report that many patients respond to combination therapy, and they also note that successful combinations are remarkably similar to the effective combinations identified in FANG studies. Both Dressler and Bacon demonstrated that serology is more sensitive for identifying Lyme arthritis than neurologic presentations. What accounts for those findings? Embers demonstrated that the C6 antibody response in prolonged, untreated disease wanes despite ongoing infection. Why does this occur? Is there a point where the immune response shifts from eradication to localized containment? Given the frequency of post-treatment manifestations and the controversy surrounding the topic, this requires a bias-free investigation. There's ample evidence demonstrating that B. burgdorferi can persist following antibiotic therapy. Therefore, we must leave that debate behind and turn our attention to investigating how B. burgdorferi survival mechanisms might be overcome. It should also be determined whether or not the immune response can become uncoupled from the pathogen such that it churns on despite the absence of B. burgdorferi. And if this can occur, how might it be stopped or prevented? Available serologic tests are unreliable and newer, shinier seroassays are not the answer. Clinicians and researchers need clinically validated methodology that can directly identify Borrelia burgdorferi. 
The trial evidence to date is inadequate, and many findings cannot be taken at face value. Thus, the optimum therapeutic approaches for all disease stages remain unknown. Lyme disease is a complex illness that does not lend itself to being studied with conventional randomized controlled trials. Pooled information from multi-centered observational studies and clinician reports might be a more efficient way to gather clinically useful information. Yet, conducting trials without a better understanding of the pathogenesis and without tests that reliably determine infection status strikes me as putting the cart ahead of the horse. Because patients need treatment in the here and now, you may be encouraged to provide therapeutic advice. Recall that what does or doesn't work for average trial subjects may not play out the same way in individual patients. Looking at this diagram, we can consider what happens when therapeutic efficacy is defined as any response to the right of a pre-selected cutoff value. When the cutoff is A, the drug is efficacious. Shifting the cutoff to B makes it ineffective for the group at large, despite remaining beneficial for some. As Kravitz points out, rigidly applying trial findings is counterproductive to patient care. Many of the physicians who treat complex and long-standing cases of Lyme disease report that their patients have more than one tick-borne infection. Unfortunately, this patient population hasn't been studied. That's a glaring hole, especially when evidence suggests the potential for pathogen synergy that may have clinical ramifications. For example, Zeidner's mouse studies demonstrated that the prophylactic efficacy single-dose oral doxycycline dropped from 47% when the animals were exposed to Bebergdorferi alone to 20% when they were simultaneously exposed to both Bebergdorferi and Anaplasma phagocytophyllum. Not all federal activities are helpful. Prevention campaigns are too limited. Some CDC and NIH-generated information contain biases or distort the evidence. This is especially true in the discussions of persistent Borrelia burgdorferi infections and the clinical utility of two-tier testing. The NIH xenodiagnostic paper claimed a different primary endpoint than that reported on clinicaltrials.gov and appeared to discredit its own positive finding of persistent Borrelia burgdorferi DNA in a patient who remains symptomatic more than 400 days post-treatment. So how do we get the biggest bang for a buck? In the immediate future, focus on educational activities such as prevention campaigns and meaningful physician education. Although the trial evidence is weak, there's enough there to prompt a change in current practices, especially with regard to managing known tick bites and patients with EM lesions. Appropriate therapeutic risk stratification in these groups should reduce the number of patients whose infections progress to an antibiotic recalcitrant state. Encourage the CDC and NIH to clean up their websites. Looking further ahead, understanding the pathogenesis of all tick-borne diseases is critical. Clinicians and researchers need reliable, direct tests of B. burgdorferi infection. The public needs a vaccine that covers multiple tick-borne diseases and provides safe, effective, and durable protection. Clinicians and patients need generalizable, patient-centered therapeutic trials. My thanks to panel members. You've taken on a truly monumental task. It looks like you're at base camp. Best wishes for your successful climb.